coos deer have the reputation of being a very elusive, hard to kill little animal with a bow, and I am the first to agree with the authorities. They're very ouchy and very hard to kill. Boone and Crockett Country, presented by Leupold. In the great debate between hunters and non-hunters, there is one fundamental truth that is escaping people on both sides of the aisle. That is, wildlife only exists because man chooses to make room for them in our lives. The statement bears repeating. Wildlife only exists because man chooses to make room for them in our lives. Man has always, in one form or another, lived in economies. What supports these economies stays, and what does not is eliminated. It's a harsh reality at times, but a reality nonetheless. History shows that the first people to rally and make noise to keep wildlife with us were sportsmen. Today, more people besides sportsmen are voicing their opinions about wildlife. These newer voices have no shortage of emotion and good intent, but they have proven to be deficient in historical scholarship, scientific knowledge, and economic realities. The question is, whose job is it then to teach them so there will be positive outcomes in the future for wildlife and man? The next question is what to teach them with. Lessons that can be used to teach the truth about hunting, sportsmen, and wildlife are everywhere. One lesson in particular is being played out in Old Sonora, Mexico, that is a perfect example and can be used as a teaching model elsewhere in North America. In the extremely rural barrens of Sonora, the people's economy is cattle. Historically, the grizzly bear, Mexican gray wolf, and black-footed ferret were native species that conflicted with cattle interests. As such, these species were eliminated. Today, the mountain lion and what few jaguars are left in North America are killing cattle. Under standard economic procedure, they too would be eliminated. It may be surprising to some, but those who are stepping in to save these predators are hunters, bow-carrying deer hunters to be exact, led by biologists and members of the Pope and Young Club. Harv Ebers is one of the founding fathers of the Pope and Young Club and is a lifelong bow hunter. A lifelong member of the uh, Pope and Young Club. I've been blessed to uh, have been on the board of directors for some 30 years and had the privilege of meeting many, many uh, old time legends in bow hunting, such as uh, Fred Bear, Jim Dartery, Fred Asbell. Over the years, I've uh, been allowed to see the club grow from its infancy into a dynamic national organization. For the past two years, Ebers has been part of a special group of bow hunters who have traveled deep into the Sierra Madre Mountains of Sonora to hunt cows' white-tailed deer. This group of bow hunters are here for the purpose not only to individually hopefully kill a coos deer, but also to support the efforts of a jaguar conservatory here in the state of Sonoro that's made up of some five or six ranches, totaling some hundreds of thousands in acres. The monies that is derived from the hunters for their cost of hunting in these camps goes directly to the ranchers to support the devastation of their livestock and in lieu of uh, direct payments they receive these monies so that they will stop shooting the jaguars. Sportsmen traveling to different parts of North America to hunt or paying as they go is not unusual. Sportsmen have for more than a century been the shining example of the user pay model of wildlife conservation. 
more so than any other user. And in many cases, sportsmen are the only paying users. What is special about this particular group is that their money is not being used to support the species they hunt, but just the exact opposite. Ron Thompson heads up a jaguar conservatory program with cooperation from the Mexican government and a handful of local landowners whose cattle ranching profits are literally being eaten by the big cats. Unless you have personally experienced such losses, it might be hard to comprehend a negative attitude towards wildlife, but such is the case here. Here's how I think an ordinary person would relate it, is that every night you go to bed, there's a, an animal out there that can reduce your paycheck the next day. That can either be a, usually a mountain lion or a jaguar in, in this country. I think you have to somehow elevate the value of a carnivore, and one way of doing that is I'm saying the value of a carnivore is its prey. You know, you relate it to the prey. And that's what we've done here in, in, in this situation. We've said, we're gonna hunt white-tailed deer. In exchange, you're gonna not kill jaguars. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Wild Sheep Foundation, putting and keeping sheep on the mountain, and the Dallas Safari Club, promoting conservation and ethical hunting worldwide. The cow's whitetail subspecies is found in southeastern Arizona, southwestern New Mexico, and the northwestern mountain ranges of Mexico. Throughout his range in the United States, as well as the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico, he mainly occupies rugged, steep mountains featuring dense brush of oak and cactus. Successfully pursuing cow's deer is probably the most advanced level of hunting in the world with a rifle, and even more so with a bow and arrow. Coos deer have the reputation of being a very elusive, hard to kill little animal with a bow, and I am the first to agree with the authorities. I hunted here on this same hunt last year. I think there was eight of us guys this first hunt. And I believe there was three coos deer taken on out, three out of eight, which is a tremendous percentage wise. I was not successful and I've returned this year determined to, to kill a coos deer. His smallness combined with a sleek slate gray coat gives him a maximum degree of almost complete transparency in brush country and their legendary elusiveness has been well adapted. I wouldn't want to be a coos deer in Sonoro because we got isolates, uh, mountain lions, jaguars, coyotes. The breadbasket for those predators is the coos deer. So they're very ouchy and very hard to kill. While long range glassing and spot and stalk techniques are preferred for cow's whitetail, on these Sonora ranches, an adaptation of African plains game and early season archery elk hunting has proven to be the most reliable. This country, as far as a bow hunter goes, is really good country to bow hunt in that it's extremely arid. I don't know what the average rainfall is down here, but I'd speculate it's probably less than 10 or 15 inches. So you have tanks that are obviously necessary for their survival, and so for the most part, you're hunting by virtue of using pop-up blinds over water holes. Like all prey species that live with big cats, these deer are well aware of the danger water holes represent. They therefore have adapted to only approach water in the heat of the day, when the cats are the least active and less likely to lay in ambush. A good question now is why would bow hunters who care about deer be interested in saving the same predators that eat deer? As a biologist and program facilitator, Thompson explains sportsmen are the reason we actually still have predators in the wild today, and why new relocation efforts are being successful. People think it's interesting that we're hunting prey of carnivores to assist carnivores with, in terms of conservation effort. It's not surprising to hunters because hunters are willing to pay for something that they support. And what I've found that is hunters do support carnivore conservation. If you look in, at North America now, carnivores have never been better off. The return of the North American gray wolf and Mexican gray wolf, all that effort has been as a result of hunters conserving and growing prey throughout the nation. So that's the only reason really why we're able to have the carnivores that we do have. If you're wondering what a jaguar study in Mexico has to do with the game and areas you hunt, the answer is plenty. 
What has been lost in all of the recent debate over gray wolf reintroductions in the upper Midwest and Rocky Mountain states is that these new wolf populations would not have stood a chance of taking hold if it were not for the efforts of sportsmen. Sportsmen were responsible for the recovery of elk, deer, and moose. Now, animal activist groups want to reintroduce wolves across their entire historic range, and biologists and sportsmen better be prepared. Large predators making a living in wilderness areas are something entirely different from these same predators living on the same shared landscapes as man. We're trying to have the ranchers understand that, hey, the carnivores do have a, a value because the hunters really see carnivores on the same level as they do the, the, the prey. It's called a compensatory predation um, rate, and that's where carnivores are out here, mountain lions and jaguars, eating prey at a rate that supports them at a sustained level, but also the prey can still make a living. It's when the carnivores exceed that rate and at that time it becomes additive mortality. In this case, if it's livestock, for instance, if, it, if they start eating more than what the rancher can sustain, the jaguar or the mountain lion is gonna lose out every single time. There's just no two ways about it. It's always been that way historically. When it comes to predators and prey, livestock and man all living on shared landscapes balances the key and balance means management. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with Buck Knives, knives that fit your life, and the Pope and Young Club for the good of bow hunting. In Sonora, Mexico, the problem was clear. In 2002, a massive distemper outbreak in this region completely devastated the javelina population, which up until that point was the threatened jaguar's primary prey animal. The jaguar of this area are endangered at this point. This is the northernmost breeding group of jaguars known in North America, and their main food source has been uh, wiped out by disease, and that's the javelina. I've hunted down here two years now, and I haven't seen a javelina. So obviously the jaguar got to survive, and so they've started killing cattle, which they didn't historically do. The rancher that we were on last year had lost 27 cows to jaguar kills last year. A substantial burn on his livelihood. So what we see that we can do is help with the funding, help with the biologists on getting javelina reestablished down here, and then in addition to that, compensate the ranchers for their loss. And along with all of that, the biologists are, are working on also research. My understanding is there's never been a jaguar collared down here, so they want that research. A world-class group of biologists and conservationists are down here working on it, and we just, we just have a small part of that. With the big cats turning more toward cattle to survive, local ranchers had no choice but to protect their livelihood. There's a business ecosystem down here, and the, the business ecosystem model was actually developed by Harvard. And it just basically says that within a landscape, there's certain goods, products, and services that are produced that support the community. Sonora, Mexico is supported by livestock. It's the number one um, industry. So if wildlife conservation is ever gonna flourish and have an impact, then you have to consider the, the private land ethic. And the private land ethic includes making a profit from the land. And the, the, the product down here is livestock. And of course, large carnivores like mountain lions and jaguars conflict with that business ecosystem. So you have a, a larger business ecosystem and then an environmental business ecosystem within that. And how the two coexist is really determines what species are gonna survive on the landscape. Logically, for a conservation initiative of this type to gain acceptance, there has to be local leadership on the ground that has a long-term vision. Down here in Mexico, there's a few very visionary people in Jesus Moreno Martinez. He's the president of the Grazing Association for this group of ranchers. Is a person that I feel has that wildlife conservation vision. They are convinced that they need to find a way to share the land with the jaguar. But they are also convinced that this can be difficult because of the economical reasons and the impact the jaguar makes. With vision and leadership in place, the next question was, could individual ranchers be formed into a unit for the greater good, knowing that they must first buy into a conservation land ethic, a decision that would not come easily? The answer is yes. It's almost like making the deal with the devil. I mean, 
why would they want to at any time try to protect a, something like a jaguar or mountain lion? The next question was, who would travel to this desert wilderness and pay to do so? We started talking about ecotourism and maybe what kinds of businesses would support a conservation effort. There's a bumper sticker on my truck that says, hunters pay for conservation. And that's exactly what we talked about that night. And from that um, evening around the campfire, we developed this idea of bringing hunters down here whereby their dollars that were spent to buy a deer tag would then go back to the ranchers and in exchange they would not persecute or kill jaguars. What the conservationists and what the biologists didn't have was a means of funding the project. And so Ron Thompson and them uh, approached me and asked me if I would be willing to put together a group of bow hunters to come down and hunt the coos deer. So it's interesting in that it's a project that's sponsored by Pope and Young in that Pope and Young has made a donation to the nonprofit, but also it's got Pope and Young actively involved in putting together the hunters to hunt a species which is in the Pope and Young record book, being the, the cow's deer. And by hunting the cow's deer down here that the bow hunters are providing funding, this year almost $50,000. Um, that goes towards the conservation effort, which is a unique uh, situation and something that we're trying to do with the Outreach Committee, which is to try to let people see that Pope and Young's not just the record-keeping facility for bow hunting in North America, but also a conservation organization. To the sportsman, this all sounds familiar. The challenge, however, is educating those who have never even heard of the North American model of wildlife conservation and just how well it works. The North American model of wildlife conservation was developed essentially by the Boone and Crockett Club, Theodore Roosevelt and uh, his compadres, was somewhat the basis for the thought process to um, bring hunters down here. We advertise for ecotourism trips and we receive very little response, surprisingly. This is a very wild, remote country. It takes a long time to get down here. It's very rough. Uh, conditions are somewhat primitive. Again, the thought was that these are the perfect conditions that hunters actually um, don't mind at all. We started out with two hunters and then we've just been building up ever since. And luckily we ran into our beavers, the last founding member of the Pope and Young Club. And him and Dirk Dietrich and Scott Hargrove all agreed to help try to put together a Pope and Young Club trip down here. And so this has been our most successful year. We've, we have uh, down here this trip um, 27 hunters. It takes a day and a half to get here, so it's, it's very remote, very hard to get here, but hunters are willing to, to do that, to come to one of the last wild places on the continent. For Harv Ebers, a second time was not the charm. Other hunters were successful, but for these bowmen, success was measured in just being a part of this conservancy. We had really good luck on this ranch this year. We had eight hunters hunting this ranch in particular, which is Napopa, and um, the eight hunters have killed uh, four coos deer. But a 50% kill on cow's deer is, is exceptional, and our largest one, I think, scored a 96, which is a pretty nice cow's deer. So I'll be here next year, and I'll be here the next year, and so will Harv Ebers, and uh, this is something that we look forward to every year, and we continue to stay after and keep people coming. So it's, it'll be an annual event. Boone and Crockett Country has been brought to you by Leupold, America's Optics Authority, and the Boone and Crockett Club, fair chase and conservation since 1887. A valuable lesson about man, wildlife, large predators, and economic and scientific reality is being played out deep in Sonora, Mexico. Biologists, cattle ranchers and bow hunters are living it. All we need to do is learn from them and pass this information on to others who are concerned about wildlife but may not be exposed to the full measure of the impacts of having large predators living on shared landscapes. The ultimate goal here is to develop a model that can be applied anywhere where there's private land and there's livestock because that's a major conflict right now is livestock and carnivores. If we can apply this to any other country then um, I think we've got a workable model. It comes down to the bottom dollar in terms of a profit. It is a valuable lesson that speaks to the ongoing commitment of the hunter conservationist that can be applied anywhere wildlife and land use controversies arise.
there's a lot to be done. I've tried to, at this point, just get the hunting part of it up and running, and I can't emphasize enough. What's pushed us up over the plateau has been this Pope and Young Club effort, sponsored by, in, in part, the, the Boone and Crockett Club. People are gonna ask, well, what have you produced down here in the last five years? And I say we've been increasing it slowly. The association's received about $150,000 from this effort in the last four to five years. It's been um, almost exponentially growing, so I see some pretty good things coming in the future. Wildlife conservation and the healthy ecosystems are tied to our health. If we degradate these systems by removing species because we feel they're in competition with humans, then as biodiversity decreases, there's a direct correlation to actually the release of many viruses to humans. And it's, it's real important to understand that. As biodiversity is lowered, the elasticity of organisms, including us, we're an organism on the landscape, is um, decreased. And once that happens, we could go the way of any other species that, that disappears. And it's, it's real important that we understand that there's a direct correlation. We're all connected. Wildlife only exists because man chooses to make room for them in our lives. Those who firmly believe that wildlife left alone will take care of itself may just be wildlife's worst enemy. Science informed sportsmen can and should do the teaching. The question is, Will those who are against hunting and the user pay model listen? Only time will tell. Closed captioning provided by the Dallas Safari Club, promoting conservation and ethical hunting worldwide. <laughs>